So I was delighted to be invited to talk about the concept of mentoring because I have found that in serving as a mentor and also in having mentors myself, uh, it has really enriched and enhanced my life. And I know that it will do the same for you. And so while I don't profess to have the how-to, I may be able to uh, share with you some of the things that have been successful for me as a mentor and also some of the things that I've learned along the way that have made me less successful as a mentor. And then perhaps together we can identify um, how we can be better mentors. So the first thing, and for those of you that are watching this um, in the privacy of your office or home or what have you, you might want to go online to the Iowa Bar Association website, and that's iowabar.org, and identify what the Iowa Bar has stated is the mission of the mentoring program. And the purpose or mission that you'll see there is number one, it's to build collegiality. And so I looked up the word collegiality in dictionary.com, and it basically means cooperative interaction among colleagues. So to begin with, if you think about collegiality just being cooperative interaction, we already have the first step of mentoring, and that is to build a relationship. In fact, a lot of people call the determination of the definition of mentoring is to be friendship with a purpose. So collegiality. Number two, to enhance professionalism. And I polled a few judges asking them what they might suggest that I talk about and professionalism came up repeatedly. And professionalism in something even as seemingly insignificant is how you dress to go to court. I had one judge say in particular that the way that some of um, the attorneys, and he, by the way, I don't want to separate younger or more wisdom, shall we say, so those of us older attorneys or more experienced attorneys, it's attorneys in general that the standard of professionalism has somewhat diminished. And so dressing to go to court, it's very difficult to tell who the lawyer is in the room. And then just how one comports themselves around clients and, and um, in the community. And then to grow relationships. Lawyering is such hard work. And we know the statistics talk about a lot of lawyers suffering. Uh, suffering in terms of depression, chemical abuse. Uh, we have a high suicide rate. We have a very, very stressful job. So to those of us, particularly in private practice or small firms or even in big firms where you're just busy and dealing with clients all of the time, to know that there's somebody walking alongside you to be able to take an interest and somebody that understands. We know that as lawyers, a lot of times our families don't understand the stress and how we're on the cell phone all the time and how we have to constantly be thinking and attentive to clients' needs and even when we try to set those healthy boundaries. But our colleagues do understand. And so to have somebody else that gets us and that knows the, uh, the burdens that we do bear as lawyers can be quite comforting to have somebody else be able to share that with you. And the other purpose on the website is to better the legal profession. And so I would say that as a topic, if you're thinking about being a mentor and you don't really know where to start or you're talking with some folks and you're trying to identify whether you'd be a good fit for mentor or mentee, is look at the purpose of the web that's expressed on the website and start to open up some dialogue with the people that you're sharing with. And that is, do we need these things? And if we do, why? And w give me some examples of why you think we need these things. And have the person that you're thinking about being in a mentoring relationship with express that from their perspective, and then certainly you can do that as well. More from the website. The Lawyer Mentoring Program creates opportunities for experienced lawyers to guide new lawyers in developing the practical skills and judgment to practice in a highly competent manner and to instill the ethical and professional values that characterize excellent lawyers. So another topic, what are the ethical and professional values that characterize excellent lawyers? Those could be conversation tips that you have with your mentee and, and mentor. I would like to suggest that we broaden that definition even more because I think when we think of mentoring, we sometimes think it has to be an older lawyer and a younger lawyer. And that doesn't have to be the case at all. I'm very aware of a new lawyer, relatively new lawyer, only been out in practice a couple of years, who is very actively a mentor. And that individual is mentoring law students now who are going through law school raising young children at the same time. That was an experience that young lawyer had. She has a lot of good insight into what happened there. 
And so even though she's a young lawyer, experience-wise, the value of her life experience can be a mentor. Um, also, I have several mentors in my life and a few that I call on quite regularly. And two of them are lawyers that are just, you know, maybe four or five years older than me, and I've been practicing law for close to 35 years. But one of them is actually a lawyer that um, practices primarily in very contentious litigation. Well, I've branded myself as a peacemaking lawyer in mediation and conflict resolution, and so you might say, well, how could that person be a mentor to you? Well, I think whenever we're only designed on studying the people that are like us, we lose our edge. And so I have a regular conversation with that mentor on what's going on in the crazy litigation world and what does that look like and how, uh, how would a trial lawyer view a particular case I have. And then I have another mentor, same vintage, who is a lawyer much more like me. And I will um, have coffee with that mentor and ask that individual about questions on a case or questions on a, a lawyer I'm having a problem with or where I feel I'm not able to find my highest self. I'm going to lose my patience. I'm going to lash out at someone, talk me off the ledge, so to speak. Um, so I, it doesn't have to be oi older lawyer or younger lawyer. It can be lawyers that have different commonalities and you can have not just one mentor, you can have several mentors. Um, so here are some reasons to be involved in mentoring relationships. We talked a moment ago that we're social beings and we need healthy relationships. And I think any time in life now, uh, there's so much pressure on performance, there's so much pressure on accomplishment, there's so much pressure on some things that can lead us away from our value systems, that having people that can hold us accountable for that and, um, you know, staying true to, to themselves as models for us. I know one of the very key mentors that I have in my life is just a person that isn't a lawyer, but is a person of impeccable moral uh, standards and has a very strong spiritual base, which is an important factor to me in my life and really makes good choices in their life. Um, and so I have that person as a mentor, not for my professional endeavors, but just as an accountability partner, partner and mentor in the kind of human being I aspire to be. We talked about lawyers suffering, and then we also say, um, talked about the burdens that we share as lawyers. So another reason why we need mentoring is because we need others to help us mature as whole people. I have found in the mentoring relationships I've had, particularly with the younger lawyers, that they've taught me more than I've taught them. And I think, you know, the idea that you're going to teach somebody something is sometimes where we can go wrong as mentors. And I think that's a hazard that we run into as lawyer, older lawyer mentors, is we think we have all the answers, we've made all the mistakes, we really know what to do, we know how to do it right, and so we're going to tell you how to do it, younger lawyer, so that you can have the benefit of our wisdom. And actually, I think that's a recipe for disaster as a mentor is if you want to sit and regale your mentee with all sorts of war stories and tell them all the ways to do it, and then when they ask you a question, spend the next half hour telling them how to do it right. I mean, after all, we are lawyers. We do love to talk. We drive our families crazy with our war stories and all of that. Well, we will drive our mentees crazy if we do that as well. So we'll talk a little bit later about active listening, but I think the most important skill that you can have, and what's difficult for us as older lawyers, is to have conversation where we do more listening than talking. And perhaps this would be an appropriate time to bring up the difference between a mentor and a coach. And I had the great pleasure of taking life coaching training. And by the way, those of you that are um, kind of tired of continuing legal education programs that are looking for something that can be a life enhancing opportunity to learn new things, life coaching is a great skill and one that I find I use that every single day in my work, particularly in my work with clients. I'm actually using life coaching skills with them that they don't know that I'm even doing. But uh, as a mentor, we're investing in someone, and as a coach, we're pulling out of someone. So if you get nothing else about the distinction between the two, those are the two. So a mentor may be having some conversation, listening to your mentee, and them asking you a question, and you telling them a little bit about what your perspective is on something. 
as a coach, when I'm coaching students or clients or other lawyers or I, in my private coaching practice, which is a real small part of what I do, um, I really do much more listening to what they want to do, identifying what they want to have happen, and then repeating back to them. So what I'm hearing you say is that you really want to X. And if it's done skillfully, coaching can be quite quite fun because I once had a student stand up that I had spent the hour life coaching and she said, oh my gosh, I just love talking to you because you tell me all the things I need to know and you have all the right answers. And what she didn't realize is I had never given her an answer. I simply repeated back to her what I heard her say and frame it in a way so that it was clearer for her and it was all the answers that she had within. So. Um, if mentoring is friendship with a purpose and puts into another person, coaching is an intentional relationship that typically has an outcome in mind. So part of it may be what is the goal? And if you're, if you're talking about coaching, then you sit down with the younger lawyer or the person that you want to coach and you basically say, is there a particular aspect of your practice or your life that you'd like my assistance in? And for example, my coach that I work with, um, who is also a, a very strong mentor of mine, the, the um, sound person with the impeccable moral life and so forth, I hired that individual and first came acro across that individual to coach me to write my book and to keep me accountable to deadlines. And so it was very project oriented. Um, some of the lawyers that I'm coaching are lawyers that are dissatisfied in the practice and want to make transition either out of the law or preferably into a law practice that's more authentic to them. So our goal is to help them identify what they want their law practice to look like, to set some goals for themselves on where they want that practice to go, and then helping coach them to hold them accountable to their goals. Mentoring, on the other hand, is much more informal and often just meeting and saying, hey, what would you like to talk about today? And then hearing from the individual is more of a social, ongoing um, activity. So how do you find the people that you want to mentor? I know the bar is doing a wonderful job of trying to do some preliminary questioning and lining people up to be able to, um, to match them up. But I can share with you a couple of different ways that I've come across mentees and, and people that I've coached. And I will tell you that what's been interesting for me, and this may not be your experience, but often the people that have sought me out to be a mentor are not typically the ones I stay with long term. Often the people that have sought me out to be a mentor are people that just want to have a very short term relationship. They w may want to shadow me in my practice. They may want to have lunch. They may want to uh, talk to me a little bit about things and then they go on their way. And I do consider that mentoring, even though it's not a long-term goal, or not a long-term relationship, rather. So I guess I want to say to those of you that say, I'm too busy to mentor, I don't have time, every opportunity you have to touch another human being's life, particularly one that sees you as a source of wisdom, even though you may think you don't have any, um, anybody that seeks you out to come and to ask you questions and to get to know you or know your legal practice or whatever it may be is a huge opportunity to impact somebody's life. Um, after doing mentoring for several years and been involved in mentors, I realized that the smallest little impact, the smallest little conversation, one moment of encouragement, one moment of saying, I believe in you. One moment of saying, no, you're not crazy. I mean, I was in mediation 35 years ago and everybody thought I was crazy. They thought it was meditation, which now everybody's in meditation. And a lot of people think those people are crazy. Um, and bottom line, it turns out I really wasn't crazy. And nor are the people that have innovative ideas in the law or ways of doing it differently. And but for those people that for a moment in time said they believed in me, even though there were lots of other people telling me, why aren't you taking depositions? Why aren't you being a traditional lawyer? Those people, um, that even though they were few and far between, that encouraged me and gave me a little bit of hope that maybe my dream could come true are people that I still look back and know that even though we didn't have a long-term relationship, they were pivotal in the trajectory of my life and finding fulfillment in my work as a lawyer. So don't overlook the opportunity to pull that young lawyer aside in your law firm and just say, let's go to coffee. Hey, tell me, 
how's it going? What are you thinking? What are you doing? Would you like to come with me uh, for a day and shadow me and sit in with me and see how I do client things? Not that you'll ever do them the same or want to do them the same, but let me show you a little bit about what I've learned along the way. Every little interaction helps and is important. Uh, more and more with technology, we're all out there, we're isolated, we don't get to see the judges anymore, we don't get to wave at each other at the courthouse and talk about cases and pat each other on the shoulder and smile and greet and connect. Connectivity is just going away in our society. So your moment in time with any other individual that you touch and that you listen to and that you let them know that they're valuable and important is huge. So. Where I have found my best um, mentoring and, and coaching relationships is in the ones where I intentionally, what do you call it, set an intention. Um, for me, I'm a, person, a spiritual person, so to pray that uh, people that would benefit from that relationship or have a mutual benefit would, would show up or to just you know, say, I'm now open for mentoring and you know, I'm going to be looking for somebody that I can mentor, those have been my most dynamic mentoring relationships. And I, I want to give you a couple of examples because I have two um, students that I mentor that I think can, can give really um, different avenues of mentoring. So how do you come together? And um, I think this is in your outline. I'm not following the outline in case you haven't noticed. But first of all, you can have like gifts, you know, if you like to talk or teach or write or whatever. So there could be things you do there. Natural abilities, maybe you're into sports and, and somebody that you mentor is into sports, or acquired skills, or interest, or chemistry because of similarities in personality, or um, motivation. One of the things I've learned is I really, because I do have a lot of people, once you, once you go out there and tell people you're mentoring, they come out of the woodwork, is I really try to be selective about mentoring those people that are highly motivated. So people that really want to, um, you know, just sort of be half-baked and not really invested, or if we call for, let's meet once a month and they cancel a meeting. I had a mentoring relationship. I was assigned in a women lawyers program, and my mentee canceled the meeting and then didn't show up at another one, and I basically said, I'm done. Um, so that may seem harsh, but um, what I found is the relationships that I do have are so fulfilling and gratifying that my time is much better spent with people that are highly motivated. So um, if, they, if you have those kind of people, uh, then you can decide what it is that you're going to set up for your mentoring relationship. So let me tell you a scenario. I had a client that I represented in a divorce, and at the conclusion of her matter, she said, you know, my niece is a first-year first law st student. She just completed her first year, and she's in a job that she hates, and she really is not sure life that um, it was the choice for her to go to law school. She's not sure she's in the right place. Would you be willing to have coffee with her? So again, not, would you be willing to mentor her? Would you be willing to take her under her wing? Would you be willing to connect with her? Would you be willing to have coffee with her? So I said, absolutely, I'll have coffee with this young woman. And when I met with her, she and I hit it off like gangbusters. And it turns out that she loved to write. And she told me about some undergraduate writing. And I said, hey, I'm writing this book. Would you like to work with me on this project? And I, you know, we can kind of just have a relationship going along the way. She said yes. So it began with a project in mind that she was going to help me with. And we had regular meetings established to make sure we were on the writing deadlines. And what ended up happening is we would talk and chat. And fast forward now, she's studying for the bar this week, which is a week from today. And um, she decided to do a private practice in a town outside of Des Moines. And I continued to mentor her and meet with her regularly. We now Skype. Uh, she's trying to think about whether she should go in with another partner. And so I coached her basically saying, what do you think? And what are the options? And what do you think about that? Does that sound right? Does that seem fair? And really helped her process so that she developed a game plan for her practice. So it happened very serendipitously. We hit it off, we had similarities, and we, she was highly motivated, and it started with a project and then morphed into a mentoring, coaching relationship that's been wonderful for both of us. And she really helped me write my book, so it worked out for both of us. 
Two other ones is when I w was teaching in law school and I was in a position to say I really want two students to mentor, I have room for that, and so who might I see here that has something interesting to say? And I listened to some answers to some students in response to questions. And there were two students in the room that really resonated with me. They both had a lot of courage to speak out, to speak and say things that were different than the rest of their classmates had done, to say things that were based on passionate uh, passion for the law. And I said, ooh, those are my people. So I went and I met with both of those individuals and I said, you know, one of the things I like to do is to identify um, students to mentor and coach and would you be willing to do that? Uh, at least go have some coffee and explore it. And they said yes. And so I ended up talking with both of them and said, I'm only going to work with highly motivated people. So if this is something you don't want to do, don't feel obligated. But if it's something you do want to do, I'm totally invested. I'd like to suggest we meet once a month. And then one of the other things I offer um, folks that I mentor is a Friday accountability email. And I found in my own mentoring uh, relationship that that Friday accountability email is really tremendous. So we'll meet once a month and we'll say, okay, what are we going to talk about today? What would you like to talk about? I'll ask the mentee. And um, then we'll have conversation, we'll set goals, we'll do whatever, wherever the conversation leads. We'll talk a little bit more of that, about that in a moment. And then I'll say, email me on Friday. So as a mentor or a coach, when I get those accountability emails in there, first of all, I'm going to see who's highly motivated if they go forward with that. And ironically, these two both did, so they turned out to be good choices. Um, and the Friday accountability meeting may, may say, I had a terrible week. I didn't follow through on any of my goals. I really, you know, I'm mad at myself that I didn't, I, I was 0 for 7 on the days that I said I was going to get up and do a morning meditation or whatever their goal they had set. Well, the mentor doesn't go, as we older lawyers will tend to do, oh my gosh, you better hit 7 out of 7 next time or at least you should shoot for 4 out of 7 or here's what a mentor or coach would ask. Wow, what got in the way? Because when you ask the question, what got in the way? Number one, you're being supportive, you're not being judgmental, and number two, they're going to tell you what got in the way. So I think setting um, time to meet and then those accountability emails, at least in my mentoring relationships, have been really terrific because they also help you stay connected during the week. And you don't have to write a long email back. My emails, and I know I found this frustrating in my own coaching relationship when I would send my coach mentor Friday accountability emails and sometimes I would pour my heart out because I just you know needed to and instead of the three long page email back it was basically wow sounds like you had a hard week um, you know get back in the game or whatever what got in the way um, let me know how it works out this next week I'll look forward to your next email well wait a minute I wanted a whole dissertation on what I did I wanted them to tell me how to live my life but what I found is by them simply asking me and knowing that they had my back, so to speak, and were interested in me and would be looking for that Friday accountability email, that was really helpful. So after you make the connection, really the most important thing that you can do as a mentor is to empower. Empowerment. If you say, I'm not sure what skills I have, if you are a person who encourages and empowers others to find their higher self, you're going to be the mentor extraordinaire. Um, empowerment involves transformational relationships in which all participants come to a healthier understanding and experience of their potential as individuals, as members of the legal profession, and members of a community who serve to empower others. So the other thing as lawyer mentors that we have to keep in mind is it's not just all about their lawyer world. It's about them as a human being. Um, in the law students that I have mentored, uh, they'll always run into personal struggles, whether it be relationship struggles or other types of struggles. Um, one young lawyer of the two that I found in the class that I mentored um, came into a situation shortly after our mentoring relationship began where his mother, um, and he, he's given me authority to use this story, and I actually wrote an article about it with his permission, so I know he doesn't mind me giving this information. 
But his mother uh, came down with, or had had cancer that came up again. She uh, had a reoccurrence of some cancer that had laid dormant. And she lived in California, and he was a law student here in Des Moines. And so he basically had to make a decision. Um, she was a single mom, and also has uh, his autistic brother living with her. And here he was, he had just gotten onto Law Review, he was an honor student, really super young man. And he had to make a choice. Do I drop out of law school and go help my mom? Or do I persevere and continue on into law school and hope that everything will stay stable until the summer? What do I do here? Well, as a mentor, I was a little freaked out. This is a big life event. I'm not a therapist, I'm a lawyer. I'm not really equipped to be able to help this young man make this very important life decision. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to do the only thing I know how to do, which is I'm going to have him make that decision and I'm going to coach him through it. So through asking questions and having him say, and then feeding back to him, what about this possibility? What about that possibility? and really listening and actively listening for what he was saying and then repeating back to him. So I'm hearing you say that you could maybe write your law review article while you're there. And then we developed a game plan. Will you go talk to the dean? And Okay, let me know in your Friday accountability email about your conversation with the dean. And we just sort of developed this whole game plan that came from him, that just had me walking alongside him, listening. Um, long story short, he went out to California. He had taken this somewhat of a sabbatical that he worked out with the dean, but he was going to still try to write his law review article. And so we began our monthly meetings on Skype, and we still had our Friday accountability emails. So he was Skyping me from California, and it became very clear that his mom was, her condition was deteriorating. He was worried that he didn't have um, the fortitude to be able to handle everything he was dealing with and deal with his law review article. He was so sad that he might lose that opportunity and not, might not be able to get it back again. And so I, again, listened, asked him about what would, how would he set his goals to be able to carve out time for the law review article. And then when it co he concluded that he couldn't, I basically said, so do we need to re-examine whether this is, is feasible for you and is really a priority for you? I didn't say, you don't have time to do the law review article. or you know, you're just not getting up early enough to get that law review article done, or, you know, what can I do to, what can I do to help take on some of your research or whatever that I can do ethically and still help you do your law review article, because a lot of us mentors are fixers too, and we have to be careful of that. But constantly putting it back to listening to him and helping him resolve his own issue. Long story short, fast forward, the young man's mother died. He, dealed, he had to deal with a lot of grief, again, on Skype. I'm not a grief counselor, but we had forged this really great relationship because I had been walking alongside him as he had done all that. And as his mentor, coach, whatever you want to call me, at the end of the day, I was just another human being that saw him suffering, that cared enough about him to be invested in his plight and to spend once a month and you know every Friday listening to him with focused attention and encouraging him. So he's now back in law school. He's amazing. He's um, just you know an incredible young man. And I guess that brings up another point about those of us that are mentoring. We like to think, oh, I'm going to instill all this into you. I found that that was a transformational relationship as his mentor. I watched a 20-something young law student navigate some of life's most grueling and painful issues with such grace um, that it, it changed who I was. So those types of mentoring relationships are meant to be two-way. And I think those of us older lawyers, another thing that we miss out on if we're not awake to it is how can these young lawyers mentor us? They're in a whole different world, and um, I'm giving a presentation soon on the future of mediation and the future of law practice and where it's going to be when these young people are my age at a th after 35-year practice. And some of the things I'm seeing are, 
are crazy uh, about what the world is going to look like. And so part of what's been fun for me is in these mentoring relationships is having the young lawyers tell me what do they see the world looking like? What are they thinking about the world? How do they feel about social media? And whether you get a star behind your name online, you've become an Amazon.com um, you know, person basically in the practice of law now. And um, how do we do all that? And me learning from them so that I keep sharp and I keep current and I keep my edge and I keep my law practice in a state of constant um, exhilaration and newness and freshness so that I can take the value of my 35 years life experience, much, most of which has been rocky and full of mistakes, and, um, and my law practice, which I've struggled to find who I really am in the law. And I can take all that and with the help of the younger lawyers that are, are, men, are my mentees, they can help me to finish strong because one of the things that's really important to me and that I, that I hope is important to my colleagues is that we don't just sort of fade into the sunset and we don't just sit at the big law firms or the medium-sized law firms or our own law firms and sort of rot in the rooms there collecting checks and doing things the same way we've always done them. That we finish strong, that we finish well, that we finish with vigor, that we finish passing the baton to these younger lawyers in a very meaningful way. And in order to do that, we need to receive from them the wisdom of their youth, the wisdom of the world as they grew up in. And it's totally different than ours. And I think when we sort of say, well, we did it better, or back in the day when we did it this way, that we're losing the opportunity for all of us as a collective to take the legal profession to the new frontier. So that empowerment piece works two ways. Um, what constitutes healthy empowerment? So how do you empower each other in the mentoring relationship? Well, there's caring and sharing of life experiences and resources. And one of the things I've also been doing a lot of research on millennials. And I'm torn between deciding whether there's really something to that or if it's all just a bunch of hype. I mean, at the end of the day, millennials are just people too. Yes, they were, they're different than baby boomers in a lot of the ways they were raised. Um, but What's interesting about one of the things I found out that millennials in particular is they like to know who you are. They don't just want to see you as some lawyer sitting in a chair in a, you know, in a penthouse suite somewhere at the top of a big building. They want to say, who are you and what struggles have you had? And I think a lot of us older lawyers are like, well, I don't really, you know, I'm not going to get that personal. I don't really want them. And, and again, there's obviously an appropriate boundary there. But what has been fun for me, um, when I teach at Drake and I teach the mediation course at the law school there is I think that the students love most of all my um, really horrible stories of the time I screwed up in court, the time I filed something wrong, the time I cried all the way home even though I kept my professional game face when the judge pointed out something uh, that my colleague caught me on something and then the judge said I'm going to have to dismiss your case because of your screw up. And I'm like, well, Your Honor, I'm sure I can distinguish the, and kept my whole, and then sobbed the whole way home. And then how do I explain to my client who said, why am I getting my case dismissed and having to admit that it was something that I screwed up? Well, those are the stories my students seem to like the most. So as mentors, I think we cannot um, miss on the opportunity of being able to tell them where we failed. Tell them things we've done wrong. Let them know, what do you do when you screw up? How can you do that and still keep your professionalism and still keep your truth? And let me tell you about when I did it. And maybe let me tell you about if I, in hindsight, when this happened to me, how I learned from that and might do it differently. So sharing of life experience and resources. Um, also, if you, you know, I have a lot of people that say, well, what happens if I, turns out I end up in my mentee, I think is depressed. I think my mentee may be drinking too much. I think, or it could be the mentee says, I think my mentor is drinking too much. Or we think we have some mental health issues. Lawyer's assistance program. I mean, I think that we need to make it clear to our mentees that we're there to walk beside them and encourage them to use resources and to go there with them, to make a call to Hugh Grady if we need to, or to sit with them, or to escort them to the counselor's office and wait for them in the lobby, or to do those things 
that lets them know who's available or to put them in touch with other people that we may know that can help them with certain things. So sharing our resources. Also, healthy empowerment means healthy growth of all parties involved. Transformation, and I'm not overselling this mentoring thing, folks. This is life transforming work. And you can transform your life through reflection and change in character, change in perspective, change in behavior, all while discovering our own uniqueness. Understanding our unique potential connects us to others in empowering ways through service. Um, here are some other ways we connect. Encouragement, being a soundboard, providing an evaluation, giving your perspective, giving advice. You can still give advice. You know, if the student says to me or the, the mentee says to me, what do you think I should do? I will continually dodge that bullet. This is where mediation training has been so good for me, constantly putting back on the self-determination of the parties. But at the end of the day, if they said, what would you do? I, I may give them my advice, but in selected situations where I think I really have some wisdom in that area. Networking, I think being a connector and introducing them to other people and saying, oh, you have an interest in that. I have a lawyer colleague that did that and let me put you in touch with them. And then you introducing that person to the colleague and having them set up, or maybe the three of you go to lunch. Um, guidance and healing. Again, um, doing the grief work with one of my mentees was, was um, you know, hearing what he would do when he went to grief counseling and kind of how he was processing that in his work um, in healing and recovery from his mother's death reminded me of some, some things that I needed to be more vigilant about in my own life, in my own healing journey from other griefs that I've had. So again, there's three ranges of this relationship. There's upward, men upward mentoring, which provides perspective, accountability, and resources. There's downward mentoring, where you're developing the capacity of younger lawyers. And then there's peer mentoring, accountability and empowering relationship among peers, either within your firm or outside your firm or within your area of practice or outside. So as far as your interactions, make sure you have regular interactions. I think where a lot of the mentoring programs that I've been involved with have gone wrong is we have a cocktail party and everybody's gonna be mentors and everybody's all happy and then everybody gets busy. So um, setting, and uh, with one of the young individuals that I'm still mentoring, the young man from California um, that's back now in Des Moines, we meet once a month, and we meet like clockwork. And if we have to move an appointment, we make sure it's set for the next time, and we just don't miss. And the Friday accountability emails come in really, really regularly. Sometimes they roll in on Saturday afternoon or what have you, but they still roll in. So really having that you're gonna have interaction. And then setting what are the boundaries of the relationship? Are you gonna have interaction outside the mentoring relationship? Are you gonna to go to lunch? Are you gonna work on projects? Or is it strictly gonna be the mentoring relationship? Really making clear from the get-go, um, can that person call you if they're in crisis? Can they reach out to you outside the mentoring meetings? Or is your expectation that this is kind of you know, just, just within the mentoring relationship. Confirming the purpose and expectations. After being in conflict resolution for 30 some years, I've boiled everything, all conflict down to one succinct um, thing for me, what I have noticed, is I think pretty much all of conflict without exception erupts when you have unclear or unmet expectations. So really having each of you decide from the very beginning. What do you expect out of this? What would you consider a good mentoring relationship? And let me tell you what I consider a good mentoring relationship. Will you have a written contract? Will you just have bullet points? Will you have a talking piece of, you know, on a document that you write down? I think having that. What are the accountability parameters? Um, how will your communication uh, mechanisms be? What is the confidentiality? Uh, I think you have to express that if you share something with me, I'm not a quote unquote mandatory reporter, but if I'm worried about you, I might reach out to the lawyer's assistance program, but I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna do that ahead of time. And that brings up another mentoring relationship that I had that I wanna tell you um, that ended in a, in a very tragic way. And that is, I mentioned the two students that I had great mentoring relationships with, 
and one student was a woman, same, same time, and very active. We met monthly. She ended up graduating from law school. She ended up going back to her home state um, and studied for the bar exam. And we continued our mentoring relationship by Skype and met regularly and had the accountability. And um, I was sort of coaching her and empowering her and encouraging her throughout the bar exam, which she subsequently failed. And I felt like it was really fortuitous that I had you know, identified her as a potential mentee all those years because I also failed the bar exam my very first time. And so I said to her, no worries, you know, this happens to the best of us, uh, you know, look how I regrouped and you're going to do that too. And, you know, what is your plan for taking it a second time and how can I be supportive to you and do we need extra accountability during this time? And, you know, we even explored the possibility that she would fly back up to Iowa and stay with her roommate that had been her study partner here at Drake and that they would study together and, you know, we were exploring all different ways to hold her accountable. So. She ended up studying for the bar exam, and I have millions of emails from her from, that I had saved, and every time I talked to her, she was upbeat, and um, I, during one of our last Skype discussions that we had, she, I, I saw sort of all this stuff in her room, and she said, I've been buried in my room studying for the bar exam for the second time. I feel a lot of pressure. I said, I get that. I totally get that. And I said, well, have you been out for a walk or whatever? She goes, no, I've just been hunkered down. And I remember just a little piece of myself saying, ooh, this isn't good. But a bigger piece, and this is where I think we go wrong as lawyers, was to say, but that's how we roll. We hunker in, we study for hours on end, we do whatever. And, um, you know, I thought, no, she, she's okay, and the bar's, you know, imminent. Long story short, she committed suicide. And, of course, as her mentee, I thought, what did I overlook? What didn't I see? What didn't I know? What kind of a mentor am I that I couldn't see that? And I went through and looked at all of the emails. And I went back and thought about the last time we Skyped, and there was nothing there. There was absolutely no sign of anything that uh, I think any of us would notice, as is often true with people that, that have that happen. And so, you know, I could have easily thought, I'm a failure as a mentor. I let another human being down. Here I had this unique appointment, if you will, to be there and be with her and to help her walk through life, and somehow I failed. And what I chose to do instead is to say that, isn't it amazing that we enriched each other's lives because I can tell you in no uncertain terms that young woman was amazing and would have been the most amazing person in the world and lawyer but for the untimely circumstances and how gifted what a gift it was I think really for both of us that during probably what I now know to be some very dark times for her there was there was somebody right there with her and certainly for me, um, I, I'm forever transformed as a result of my interaction with her. So, um, so this is not just foo-foo work. It doesn't, you don't just have a cocktail and, and you know, say Godspeed, although you can do that because as we talked at the very beginning, even that moment in time is meaningful. But if you do decide to embark on these, on these relationships with, with younger lawyers, um, it, the possibilities of how you touch each other's lives is really tremendous. I want to wrap up um, and see if there's anything I've overlooked just here in my notes. Um, oh, listening. We didn't get to talk a lot about listening. I'd just like to read, and I didn't give you this slide. This is from Thich Nhat Hanh. He's a Buddhist uh, great thinker in mindfulness. And I think I love this idea of listening as he describes it. And he calls it compassionate listening. And because I wrote this book, The Compassionate Lawyer, and have been doing a lot of thought about compassion in the law, and does it make you a wimp if you're compassionate, or can you be effective and still be compassionate, I think it's important to understand the, the meaning of the word compassionate. And compassion really means to understand that someone else is suffering, and to do what you can help them alleviate that suffering. 
And so here's how Thich Nhat Hanh describes compassionate, compassionate listening. listening. Compassionate listening has one purpose, to help the other person suffer less. You have to nourish the awareness that no matter what the other person says, you will keep calm and continue to listen. You do not judge while listening. You keep your compassion alive. The other person may be unjust, may say inaccurate things, blame, attack, or judge. Yet you maintain your energy of compassion so that your seed of suffering is not touched. Practicing mindful breathing while listening is very helpful. Breathing in, I know that I am listening in order to make this person suffer less. Breathing out, I remember the person in front of me suffers very much. So I have some other pointers in your handout about listening, but if you think I'm listening, breathing in, reminding myself that this person is suffering, and breathing out, um, I, I want to help them suffer less, basically that means I don't interrupt and tell them, oh, I know, you know, your mother's dying, I remember when my dad died, and it was so terrible, and, I, and sort of hijacking the story or they say something that goes against your values, goes against your political beliefs, goes against your religious beliefs, goes against your humanness, and you don't go, really? Well, have you ever thought that there's another perspective on that? You simply sit in compassion. And if the most succinct thing I can tell you about listening is don't talk. <laughs> Just don't talk. And even sometimes a silence can be empowering. And then as they say things to you, you repeat back in a summary fashion without going, so if I heard you say X, X, X like wrote, you basically say, wow, so that grief is very overwhelming to you. I hear that. Tell me more. Tell me more can be the best words you say in a listening endeavor. Um, I'm trying to be conscious of time. Let me see. Uh, one quick other thing I'd like to say is the other thing we can be as mentors is, is we can be empathetic. And so to those of you older lawyers that are doing this, I guess I would say, do you remember what it was like when you were a younger lawyer? And if you don't, maybe it would be interesting to go back and think about that or to ask somebody that's known you since you were a younger lawyer something about that so that you can remember that part of your own journey. Um, I'm going to have Christy give me some questions now. I know it looks like we were having some trouble with the sound a little earlier. Um, okay. So just to let everybody know that we are taping it and we'll be putting it on the web so you'll have a different quality once we put it on there. If you do have a question, you can go ahead and type it. Or I'm also guessing Kim would um, welcome your questions if you email them to her too. Yeah, absolutely. I also wanted to tell you if this is an interesting topic to you, we're having a day-long workshop on mentoring. Um, it's $50. And if you want to email me, Kim at the Compassionate Alliance, one word, the Compassionate Alliance .com, I can um, brief you on more details on where and and so forth. And it has been approved for continuing legal education credit. Anybody in the audience have a question? Maybe I'll just spend the last few minutes then talking about um, how do you close a mentoring relationship. Um, let's say you decide to have a mentoring or coaching relationship and it has to do with a project. Like let's just, you know, so where are my mentoring relationships going with the mentees that I've, I have now in my life? I have terminated um, very painfully just within the past 
month or so, um, two mentoring relationships that I really felt were um, uncomfortable for me to continue in the mentoring relationship because of some personal choices that some mentees were making. Um, that I was trying to be compassionate and listen and guide to resources when I saw the train starting to go off the tracks and um, sort of sang, sang the alarm bells that I have some very deep concerns about this or that situation. Uh, I want to let you know that I'm sort of telling you that you're about to make a horrible mistake or a horrible choice or you're making some horrible choices. Here's, uh, I, I offered the possibility of going to my own coach, this impeccable moral person, to, you know, and to pay for that because I felt like this situation was beyond my capability and um, the, there was no interest in doing that. And so I painfully had to terminate the mentoring relationship and I've had to do that twice. And um, that was difficult, but you know, it happened. As far as other mentoring relationships, I think the ones I've had more longer term were constantly checking in and saying, okay, so is this relationship still a value to you? Do you want to continue in the formal mentoring capacity? Um, if you do, you know, that sounds great, but constantly checking in and then realizing them, some, some will transition away. You know, I think there's an old saying that says some people are in your life for a, a purpose, or a, a purpose, a season, a reason, and sometimes you're just meant to be in that person's life for a season to help guide them through something. Um, the woman that helped me write the book, I, there was a time when I lost contact with her. She went and clerked for another lawyer and that was great. Every once in a while she would come up for lunch and run some things by me and just let me be a sounding board and then I wouldn't see her for a long time. Now she's going to go off and start her practice. I suspect I'll hear from her occasionally on an as-needed basis. But we'll, we probably won't have a formal, uh, you know, more structured mentoring relationship. But again, just checking in. Is this relationship working for you? Are there things you'd like to do different? Here's kind of the bullet points we decided when we first started out. Is that still working? Are we still following that? Should we redefine our relationship? Do you want to terminate this and just kind of call me when you need me? Um, you know, but just again, having ongoing dialogue about that. And then, you know, I think the other thing is if you get in a mentoring relationship and you're just not a good fit, you really have to click with the person in some way. So if you're not a good fit, and I would say that I'm sure the folks that are running the Bar Association mentoring program, that doesn't mean you can't just be, you know, a nice person to have an occasional conversation with that individual or whatever, but if you want a deeper mentoring relationship, you can certainly um, reach out to somebody at the bar, if you'd like to mentor the law students, I mean, they are just loving mentoring. They are really liking um, being able to shadow and sit in with practicing lawyers, even for a day, just to have them watch what you do. Uh, certainly give the law school a call or you can contact me. I you know, do, do a lot of mentoring with law students and continue to teach at the law school. Um, so however you want to dive into this, we really need each other in the practice of law. We really need each other. So I really urge you to, uh, to consider this as something that, that you would really enjoy.